Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Monique J. Bogie, so I'm the head of the public program here at the AA. And I'll be chairing tonight's conversation along with Florian Eidenberg, who co-produced the series, who's the founder of So Ill for What Objectives. Um, so last month, the series began with a conversation around the idea of homeland as a place of origin or a space of autonomy. Um, and our three speakers used the reemergence of British nostalgia as a longing for sometimes fictional time or place, the role of maps as a form of self-portraiture to better understand our identity, and the rise of populism across Europe as tools and trends to navigate our current condition. Tonight's conversation will explore the concept of border as an arbitrary line drawn on a map to demarcate one sovereign entity from another. This line in reality becomes a thickened territory, a space of negotiation, friction, change, conflict, and negotiation as um, the line travels between different contexts and understandings of land ownership and political identity. How can this line of tension become an opportunity to design new spaces of change and exchange is one of the questions we'll be discussing tonight. So um, these types of questions in the series as a whole are framed as part of a larger uncertainty, which is our future relationship with the EU. And it is this that will take as our starting point for tonight's conversation, thinking of how as we continually redraw and redefine our edges, so too do we negotiate new relationships with the outside world. So to briefly introduce tonight's speakers, um, Michelle Provost at the end is based in Rotterdam as the head of the Independent School for the City. She's the co-founder of Crimson Historians and Openness, and she's the director of the International Newtown Institute. And tonight she's going to discuss the border through various projects she's worked on, including this independent school, but the city of comings and goings, and um, to kind of question what the border could mean nowadays. Um, then following on from that is Platon Isaias. Um, he's an architect, researcher, and educator. He's the co-director of the um, Projective Cities MPhil in architecture and urban, and, and urban design. And he's a unit master here at the AA of um, Diploma Unit 7. And that unit specifically looks at the territory of the North Sea. And tonight he'll discuss how borders begin to define this space and perhaps carve out new relationships between the UK and the neighbors it connects to through this important tract of water. And finally, Michael Young um, is an architect and educator practicing in New York City, where he's the founding partner of the architecture design studio Young and Ayata. Michael is currently an assistant professor at the Cooper Union, and tonight he'll be speaking about ethics and aesthetics uh, in relationship to the border from potentially an American perspective. And as we know, they also have a kind of border situation going on right now. Um, so uh, lastly, I guess the series was made possible through the generous support of the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and um, we are really grateful for this. Um, and before I hand over to tonight's panel, uh, Roel van der Ven from the Embassy would like to say a few words about the series. So please join me in welcoming him to the AA. Well, hi. It's so good to be here. Um, I, I think it was about a year ago when, when Florian and we met. And uh, I don't know, uh, you must have experienced this, that, that you meet inspiring people, and um, for me, meeting you was, I think, as of the start, it, all of a sudden we were talking about design and future, and there was this richness of your, your ideas. So when you uh, said, let's do something with the AA, I said, wow, yes, that, that must, be, uh, must be done. So we're very, very happy to support uh, this event. Um, I think it's it's very timely. It's it's very uh, inspiring and intellectual. So, uh, looking forward to the debate. And of course, I've been thinking. Although I'm a diplomat, I'm not the designer. Not, uh, but I worked at the Ministry of Culture for uh, for a long time. So, reflecting on on border, I thought, what 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 would there be that I can, could could would pop up? And basically, there were three concepts. It was the concept of property. Um, it was uh, the concept of sharing and, and the concept of neighbor. So if you allow me just yeah. to, to reflect on that. Um, it would be easy to, to, to just frame border in a Brexit context, but I think that would be wrong uh, because, yeah, basically borders are everywhere. Um, the border... Uh, you, in your guard, the fence in your garden, or, or the roads that crosses a town, or, or whatever the walls between our houses are, are, are in fact borders. And um, so borders are everywhere. 
And what, what, what popped up in me is that borders are always linked to property. It's always, it's, this is mine or this is yours. And a time ago I was reading this, this, this booklet. Uh, it's, I think it's fiction, but it's good fiction. It describes uh, the, the Papalagi, describes uh, uh, a trip of, uh, of a chief from Samoa, from the Pacific to, to Europe at the beginning of the uh, last century. And one of the things that is interesting is that this, uh, his people basically had the same word for mine and yours. So um, in our, in our, we would phrase it this as, as possibly as as ours or as a kind of common good or a, a, but we always fall back in mine and yours and I think if if we look at at ours at the common goods all of a sudden the border comes in a in a different perspective and uh, that brings me to to sharing because I think sharing a country to owning is the concept of the future. And uh, we see that we share cars nowadays, and we, uh, we share our tools, and we share spaces. Um, but I think there's a huge, huge challenge uh, to, to develop a sharing re relationship between nations. So if I, I would say from, from a uh, well, diplomat perspective, it would be great if, uh, and I think Brexit in, in this way is, is a challenge to, to see how we can develop a kind of sharing community between the European Union and, uh, and the UK. Finally, I say sharing is caring, and, uh, and caring is what good neighbors do. So um, basically, um, well, from the Netherlands, uh, we care about the UK um, as we are naughty neighbors, and we will stay naughty neighbors. So uh, I would like to, 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 to conclude with that positive note that we, we will absolutely stick to the UK, whatever may happen. And uh, I think I've said enough. So uh, I think I'm, I'm now going to hand over to you, Florian. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank, thank you. you. Oh. Um, so the format is where three of our speakers will make a short uh, statement and then we'll have a, a conversation. Um, I prepared some similar remarks in summary that you did, so I'm not going to repeat those. Um, I was thinking, though, as architects, and I think what was, so the positive note that Hu ended, and I think the way we spoke about it last time also is not, we, we can reflect on what is happening, but we should also start to imagine, you know, what, what can we do and how can we move forward. And what was very productive last time was um, the sort of emergence of a set of attitudes or tools that we could use uh, moving forward as designers. And we had conversations about um, what is the role of the architect and the designer uh, within this new um, reality, uh, and also what is the future of education, which I think is a very um, uh, relevant um, um, discussion, certainly here at the school. Um, and as architects, we draw lines, right? Um, that's basically what we do. We actually, you know, the, the main role of the architect is to draw a line, to draw uh, a division. And so now that we have to rethink um, the way we draw these lines, um, uh, you know, or what is the, what is the, the, the say, the, the, the strength of such line? I think if Ruhl is saying um, we should share or there need to be common areas, it, m it might mean that we need to draw our lines much less sharp. Maybe we have to make very fuzzy uh, lines, very uh, diffuse lines, lines where you're not actually sure if you're at the one side of the edge or the other side of the edge. And I think um, that could be an interesting um, new way to think about architects not drawing very clear and clean lines, but drawing very fuzzy and very messy and very uh, ambiguous lines. But that's my small contribution. Uh, I think uh, Mike, uh, wait, Platon, you're going to start, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we'll have a larger conversation. All right. um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, it's an opportunity for myself and Hamed Kostravi, my teaching partner, just to say a few things about the studio that we started this year at the AA. And if you want, I'll just present a few points uh, just to begin the conversation, and then maybe we can come back to some of the issues that you raised during the conversation. So I think um, the Brexit as a political condition is a very, something that we cannot avoid but discussing it today. 
borders also are not the same, they're not experienced in the same way. I mean, the color of your passport, the color of your skin, plays a fundamental role of how you experience this. Um, uh, any kind of border uh, in the national, uh, international uh, scale. But also, you know, I just want to say a few, th another thing before going into the uh, studio that um, I find, uh, for me, it's a question of how we define this problem of, of the European Union and we, uh, the, the relationship that we have as nations or as peoples or societies. Because don't forget that, you know, the quite uh, smooth space of uh, capital and labor flow in Europe is based on extreme violence on other borders, right? For example, you know, the death in the Mediterranean is the price that we pay and others pay for our own smoothness in Europe, right? So we should never forget about that, right? Now, in the context of the studio, um, what we tried to do was to actually say that the North Sea, which sits in the middle of a series of international uh, and historic disputes, is a kind of exemplary space uh, of not peaceful relationships, uh, but coexistence through uh, conflicts and violence and disputes that historically found different ways to be, uh, different resolutions, if you like, right? Um, and now we are probably experiencing one of the most peaceful moments of that history. I mean, the North Sea was never, uh, historically at least, a, a space of, of cooperation. It was a space of war. And that's, that's somehow fine. We embrace that history in our studio. We embrace also the differences between the different conditions, climatic, environmental, social, of the North Sea. Uh, our students, in uh, close collaboration with uh, another studio in Delft, they did a week-long trip around the North Sea, and they actually saw completely different types of settlements, com completely different types of environments. So the idea that, you know, in a way we start unpacking this space uh, and understanding its, its differences and the different types of, uh, and forms of living. Now, um, something that we also uh, underline in the studio is that um, all these disputes and differences should be somehow kept alive. The same way that we keep alive differences and disputes and conflicts when we draw a line in architecture. So a window doesn't resolve the problem that it's 25 degrees inside and five degrees outside. The window just negotiates this problem that we need a specific type of comfort inside here and a specific type of environmental condition outside. So in a way, with this example, how do we think about a territorial and urban problem where we, we never resolve a problem, we never resolve a conflict, but we keep it active and alive. And for us, this was something that informed our brief writing, but also the directions we gave to our students. Um, the problem of, or the Brexit as a political, let's say, as an example of what's going on nowadays, is very important because in a way, the North Sea uh, and the disputes about, for example, fishing, resource extraction, energy production, were central into the Brexit uh, debate. So the communities uh, in the east of the UK were among you know, the most uh, uh, conflictual and complicated uh, 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 entities on this dispute. So you know, questions about you know, who fishes where and when. Uh, to whom this energy belongs and how. I mean, all these problems, and we're talking about communities that historically were quite well off until recently, and then through, th I mean, the EU for them was, uh, and the agreements that the UK had with the EU was actually a problem mm, that changed completely the social, economic, and environmental uh, ecology of this uh, settlement. So for us, um, we kind of try to approach this with care and, 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 uh, somehow very considerate ways of not to provide solutions to these problems, but actually to understand um, how the specific spatial order of the North Sea with all its boundaries and borders and conditions has informed a specific type of uh, space and space disputes in land. So the relation between land and sea, which is also historically a very important one for us. I mean, most of the things that we do uh, and we understand when we're talking about urbanization, have to do a lot with spatial orders 
conditions that have been uh, developed in order to uh, colonize uh, the sea and then the land. So this, in a way, the North Sea has, and our approach to it, has a constant reference to the histories uh, of colonization, the histories of scientific, political, economic, and environmental disputes um, that colonialism has uh, uh, developed across the entire uh, planet. Um, I think I would leave it there uh, for now, and then we can come back to some of the uh, th themes that you raised uh, before. Yeah. I'm going to do something old-fashioned, which is show images. <laughs> I'd like to. Um, for the last years, already three years, um, my office has been looking into this topic of migration. Of course, we started in 2015 with uh, the so-called refugee crisis, um, when our borders, like uh, it was just, everybody will remember that point in time, when uh, the focus was on that, uh, almost in a hysterical matter, I would say, uh, creating this polarization between uh, us being inside and those being uh, outside. Um, and this for, was for us a question, well, the reason to put the question, what can um, uh, architecture historians, architects, planners, uh, contribute to uh, this, this urgent societal um, um, question? And we started this project, A City of Comings and Goings, and it actually deals with this uh, well-known fact that um, our cities are not static cons constructs. They are places that have, from the, the beginning of history, been shaped by people coming in and going out. And um, so we decided to use this sort of, this crisis at that moment in time to zoom out, to zoom out in time, to point at the sort of eternal importance of migration, but also to zoom out in a different way, uh, not only uh, focus on uh, refugees and people coming from um, uh, mainly Syria and Africa, but to look at all those groups that make up the migration uh, flows going in and out of our cities, like, um, well, expats, international students. I guess many of you uh, yourself have come from uh, another country. Uh, EU workers, asylum seekers, etc., etc., tourists, not to forget. So all these groups together um, share that uh, the fact that they temporarily are living in the city and that they uh, stay for longer or are shorter, and they have their uh, own demands of feeling at home in the city. Um, of course, there's many, many differences between those groups. Um, not to mention this one. Um, that some are uh, very welcome and cities actually compete for them. Uh, so international students, I would say, but also expats, uh, wealthy foreigners, those are groups that cities compete for. And others, of course, uh, are not the, the, the groups that are easily uh, taken into, uh, into the borders. And of course this has, uh, well, there it has to do with Brexit because this is also a topic that um, is very relevant for that. But um, that refugees from the poor countries are not so welcome in uh, European countries, I don't have to explain. But what is uh, actually a new, from the most recent years, a new phenomenon is that also tourists are increasingly becoming unpopular. Um, that cities like um, uh, Barcelona, Amsterdam, uh, Venice are actually suffering from tourism, that a city like Barcelona has uh, seen protests and demonstrations saying, please give us asylum seekers instead of um, tourists, because they overcrowd the city and they, uh, they um, alienate, uh, alienate the people who uh, live there from their own city. And uh, again, it also has, it has been mentioned that it also has to do with city property and uh, it, um, all those migration flows increasingly make uh, cities in uninhabitable for, uh, for, for residents. So should we take uh, housing out of the market, which is a discussion that is increasingly um, uh, heard in, uh, in the Netherlands and in uh, other um, circles. <coughs> 
Um, so what do architects, how do architects usually deal with these um, uh, comings and goings of people? And um, here you see that temporariness equals temporary housing, which may sound logical, but in fact it's not. Um, migration is not something of one moment in time, it's an ongoing phenomenon. So why should this uh, housing be temporary? The inhabitants are, but the housing is not. So um, from this, we also asked us the same question, like how we can we move forward? What can architects do? What kind of advice do we have? What should be put on the agenda? And um, we collected, um, uh, well, we actually made a catalog of projects which uh, have been made in Western European uh, cities. Uh, in which, and this is of course a, a kind of an ideological um, uh, issue, we um, had three criteria, criteria of uh, selecting projects that were, according to us, bringing something new and um, pointing into the right direction, which is uh, the P of permanence. So um, that, that is a statement, really, that um, to, in, to counter the uh, effects of migration, you don't need to build temporary buildings, but you need robust and permanent architecture, which is good quality architecture. The E is the E of emancipation, um, stating that architecture should offer the chances to migrants to emancipate and improve themselves and climb the social ladder. And the um, S is for shared space, uh, saying something not about architecture in particular, but about public space, giving uh, residents of a city the chance to be amongst other groups and to um, uh, make overlapping uh, possible of the different bubbles of migrants that we uh, that we have. So you see, these are kind of um, the um, yeah again maybe old-fashioned social democratic values that have been put on uh, on the uh, agenda for uh, architects, and uh, I put it forward for uh, discussion. Next statement that I would like to put forward for uh, discussion is that um, uh, the question of identity. Um, We've al I've already mentioned the group of the tourists and of international students. If we look at uh, cities like uh, the, the capital cities, like uh, in this image, Rome and Paris, Berlin and Amsterdam, but it could easily also have been uh, London, then we see that each city advertises itself and uh, pro proclaims and strengthens its own identity only to uh, um, become actually more of the same with the other cities that it's competing with. So there is a, you could say there's a network of uh, historic, beautiful cities, um, historic European cities that are um, increasingly attracting the same uh, tourists and the same groups of people traveling from one city to, uh, to another. And um, in fact, the stronger the identity, the more these cities are becoming the same, you could say. <coughs> and what is also becoming uh, increasingly the same is that these cities have a center which is uh, international and beautiful and smooth and, and rich. Uh, while if you take the, the tram or the bus and travel for 30 minutes to the outskirts, to the periphery of the city, then this is what you see. The, so this is again Rome, Paris, Berlin and Amsterdam. And there you see uh, the same uh, kind of environments uh, which are particularly not smooth and not rich and also not uh, wide European uh, where no tourists ever uh, goes to uh, unless it's uh, by um, uh, by accident. Um, and uh, it is reflected into um, into these maps again of the force uh, the, the, f the same cities in which you can see that uh, people from with a non-western uh, background are increasingly to be found are living in the periphery of the cities close together in um, con concentrated areas and not in the center so what we are seeing, this is the statement, that's that uh, we ha we are we're not only talking about borders of the nation states, but also within our own countries, there's very strict borders, which could actually connect the, 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 the rich city centers more to each other uh, than they are connected to their own peripheries. And these peripheries are more connected to peripheries in other countries than they are to their uh, center. So there is actually uh, a different sort of um, uh, border that we can perceive um, in, in the countries itself. And I think uh, 
that is something that we should be very aware of because this is a beginning trend that is uh, strengthening um, as we speak. And um, just to illustrate that, it's not very visible, but this is one of the things that amazed me. Um, professionally, with the Newtown Institute, I, I visit Milton Keynes a lot. And uh, Milton Keynes, city of design, the modern city, the most uh, successful uh, new towns of uh, all new towns in uh, Great Britain, is also the capital of uh, the homeless. So all these uh, beautifully designed uh, overpasses are lined with uh, tents where uh, homeless and homeless families um, sleep and live. And uh, so this border is um, everywhere. Thanks. Let's, let's uh, work on the aesthetics. That's a little bit better. We'll make it a little bit better. So I, I figured it's important, since I'm going to talk only about aesthetics, uh, that there's some images to look at. Uh, so we've all heard this phrase. Uh, it's a quote that's popular, but that's just aesthetics. Uh, it's usually said by someone who wants to make it clear that aesthetics are just the sprinkles on top, just the, the way that things look, just the visual appearance of the world. And there's something much more real, much more important, much more fundamental that this, these aesthetics are hiding, and those are the, the kind of fundamental issues of economies, of power, of politics, of the ways in which real operations with real consequences, with real questions are operating underneath the aesthetic layer. So it is maybe at some level frivolous, maybe just sprinkles, but there's also another implication in that, that somehow there's something nefarious about aesthetics, that aesthetics are hiding, masking, concealing real, serious, and substantial problems. This puts aesthetics always in a secondary category. It's something always after the ethical or the epistemological, the, the, the real things. Aesthetics is doubted for its reality. But as we know, or as maybe all know, for five weeks there was a shutdown of my government in the United States over just aesthetics, a fight about a border wall, a fight about the way in which that border wall should appear. And we could very easily and, and should and rightfully so uh, realize that in this fight, no one's actually fighting about the real causes, economic disparity through accelerated capitalism. Nobody's talking about uh, the global migrations due to political or, or climate crises. Uh, these are very real things, and these are uh, serious issues through which one should discuss a question like the border. Um, and we could also say that this maybe is just a conversation in America between the posturing of political parties about who has the support of one base and who should then not give in to that person because that person is not popular for this reason or that reason. And we can all have our own opinions about those. I'm sure you, you probably can assume where mine lie uh, in this uh, negotiation. Um, but that's actually not the way in which the government shutdown was positioned. It was not actually where the argument lied. The argument lied in the aesthetics of what that border should look like. So yeah, there's us. Whoop. That's a border wall. And then there's not us. And the aesthetics of that wall as a solid, impenetrable, concrete thing is more than just symbolic. It actually produces different effects. The solid wall, literalized line of a concrete architectural object uh, conceals, actually aesthetically removes the other that is on the side. It's more than just a linguistic conversation. That solidity, that kind of uh, removal of visibility produces a fiction. Because a line is arbitrary, a line drawn on geography, this is an arbitrary thing. The fact that we have to literalize it through physical manifestations of architecture is absurd, because this wall already exists between Mexico and the United States. Uh, this is a fight about aesthetics. 
And in the solidity of that wall, it not only generates a reflection that adds a cohesion and an identity to a certain group of people who feel threatened by that border within the United States, it also aesthetically removes the other that is on the other side, producing the idea or the fiction that these two things can seamlessly exist on one side or the other. We are this, they are that. The border literalizes that sort of fictive construction. All right. It's nice to do performance art with word. Um, us. Well, again, the Mac is putting all my uh, things in the wrong place. That's an array of drones. Because the other proposition uh, by the other party was not to get rid of the border, but to articulate it with a different aesthetics, an aesthetic of technological vision, of surveillance, of occupation. So the border wall is no longer a visible thing, but the border wall is very real. It is an army of drones surveilling this uh, uh, imaginary line. So that now people are translated into data data to be stored, recorded, and analyzed very far from the border within the powers of bureaucracy. And this is a very creepy thing. This is not a border that we can go now to the, to the land of the Rio Grande and look at something solid and physical, but it is a very real border nonetheless, and it's a border that is transforming the aesthetics of what is the identity of one population into the statistics of control within the uh, occupying the population, in this case, the United States in the region between the United States and Mexico. Both of these are actually dubious from the point of view of ethics. Uh, and this is just to look at the aesthetics of both these counter propositions. So this leads me to a question like, uh, can we have a just aesthetics. Can we have a, an aesthetics based on justice, an aesthetics based on ethics? Can we uh, work to actually have an, an ethical position and then give it an aesthetic that allows us to articulate those relationships? Oh, this is important. That should be a question mark. Um, because I wonder about it. I think we'd all want this. I think we'd all agree that we'd want to have a just aesthetics, an aesthetics based on ethics. But this gets slippery, and it gets slippery in a number of manners for whose ethics? When do ethics slip into morality, slip into ideology? How is that then aesthetically represented? We have a very bad track record as architects for the aesthetic representation of political ideology. I think we can question this um, pretty fundamentally. <coughs> The other thing is, what is the fundamental relationship of ethics? One of the things that happens when we have an ethical relationship with another is we have an empathetic tie to them. Empathy is initially an aesthetic response. So this leads me to other kinds of formulations, like is ethics just aesthetics? Is that a possibility? Well, now I'm also very worried because we've slipped into another problematic tie because uh, if ethics is just aesthetics, um, then what do we do when we see a sea of red hats? What do we do when we see a sea of yellow vests? What is actually the difference between those other than we may feel that we are ethically more tied to one side or the other side? Uh, when identity is given through an aesthetic device that provides a voice or a way in which a population can see each other, express a concern about marginalization, there is a real concern that we need to talk about. And it's one that we cannot avoid or suppress just by saying, I feel like I am ethically right and those other people are not. It becomes a problem. So maybe to wrap up this little thing, whatever it may be that I'm saying, there needs to be a border. Oh, look at this. Between ethics and aesthetics. But not a border that blocks them out, not a border that uh, 
uh, is an either or question, but actually an understanding that we need to do both simultaneously. They are both ways in which we fundamentally relate to the world and the moment that we compress them into each other or cause one to be the fundamental root or the causality for the other, we get into quagmires. We get into problems that we cannot resolve. And as architects, we are responsible for the aesthetics of the background of reality. It is one of our deepest responsibilities and I view that as an ethical commitment on my part. And if we can understand and or alter the aesthetics of the background of reality to be other than we assume it to be, we give a potential voice to people that occupy this world to be other than they assume their world to be. And that to me is uh, one of the most powerful ethical responsibilities that we have as architects and as designers. That's it. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, <coughs> thank you all for these contributions. I. Um, I uh, think there are numerous provocations here to start um, a conversation, which uh, hopefully uh, will also include all of you here in the room. Um, what I thought, um, if, we, if we think about the three presentations, um, and I was thinking about the spatial relationship that is basically, um, say, sketched out in these three uh, conversations around uh, the border, um, maybe we can look at them in three different ways. Um, I think um, the first, the, the, the idea of the North Sea, um, you just, so maybe the, the first border is a very ambiguous border, is a multi-layered border, border in, in the first uh, border we looked at uh, uh, today, in which multiple sort of realities um, exist on top of one another, multiple jurisdictions and multiple stakeholders have multiple sort of interests. And in some way, um, you, the, the potential that you see in that border that, we, that you described is also one um, that actually um, strengthens or allows for differences to coexist and, and that, the nego that basically it's a space of negotiation between which these things happen, but it's sort of a place. I would say it's a zone where you can, can be. And then I think Michel's border was a border that um, is found not just um, sort of in a traditional space, but one that we can maybe discover much closer to ourselves, but is one to go towards, I have a feeling, and you see it as a... Um, um, you're describing um, the potential of actually exploring the differences be in that border that is quite uh, defined. I'm thinking here about the border, for instance, within our cities where you go, as you also described, um, the border in Milton Keynes, for instance, where that space is actually um, uh, a place to go to and a place of opportunity. Um, and then I think the last border you described, uh, Michael, here was a border where you actually walk away from. Um, where you where you, you you don't seek this border, you don't seek the difference necessarily, but you you allow for um, 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 both sides to be to an extent, and maybe sometimes check in. But it's <laughs> it's not actually trying to emphasize the border as a as a space to um, maybe discover um, uh, um, uh, yeah a new opportunity, but actually the fact that you walk away from it, you turn your back towards it, and allow. Uh, things to be so. For, so maybe my first question is: do, do, uh, Does anybody feel extremely offended by my uh, analysis <laughs> of that uh, <laughs> um, uh, observation? No, but uh, maybe to add, and that could also be um, uh, a, yeah a difference to uh, for the discussion's sake. Um, I think there is a, a value in itself in um, uh, researching the border, seeing it as a space in itself with its own um, uh, characteristics, uh, ethics, aesthetics, etc. Uh, our position would, my position would actually be that borders, borders are for crossing. So in, in numerous ways. So uh, that would be uh, social, geographical, physical, um, and that, if you talk about uh, uh, putting something on the agenda, uh, then that would be uh, the position that I would uh, take. Um, so that would be in, in the sense of physical borders, uh, connecting different uh, areas, but also connecting groups of people in a social sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I'm offended 
Florian. And and at, at, I offend you a little bit. Later. Uh, no, it's it's a little bit of offense is, is a good defense. It's uh, it's understandable maybe, but I, I I hope it doesn't come across that this is this is an issue that I would like to walk away from. Uh, I I feel very strongly that we as architects cannot walk away from this issue, but I also with that feel very strongly that that the questions and debates that have existed within uh, social, national identities and policies and those factors, uh, what we need to be able to deal with is the aesthetics of what these propositions actually are. This is something as designers, as architects, that we are deeply involved in, and it is not uh, a light task. It is, not a, it is not an issue that is somehow just uh, uh, secondary, I would say, to the to the thing at hand, because actually, when you consider those aesthetics seriously, they put it into and reframe the border in a different manner. Um, you know, it's always good in, in a conversation about a, a deeply European issue to invite an American for comic relief, uh, and and so I, I will not uh, step over my bounds because I I have been in that situation before and and will hold my border, but. Uh, there's an island, and that island presents a certain aesthetic to a condition of identity. And then there's a tunnel, and one of the things maybe we can talk about too, because this crosses, I think, believe, between the North Sea and uh, many of the issues, especially the Milton Keys that you presented, is uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is often a shared space, either nationally or internationally. And so one of the questions I actually I have a, a lot about is, in this move of the Brexit, what happens to the infrastructure, the channel, the airports, the, these things uh, that are actually the stitching of policies and of relationships, but also of a kind of aesthetic of being able to move through these things that architects are, are always involved in at some level. Even if we don't like to talk about infrastructure as an aesthetic project, infrastructure is an aesthetic project. Yeah. Um, there's something I want to add, which is that I think every, I mean, the, the state bureaucracies and border agencies, and especially in this current uh, technological paradigm, always work with classifications. So the border is never, I mean, the experience of a border of a, or, of, or of a difference between us and someone else goes through a very, very structured, power, I mean, I mean st structured classifications in influenced by power relations, colonialism, racism, and so on and so forth, right? Nowadays, there are, you know, software that, you know, voice recognition, face recognition that classifies me versus something else, right? So there's all this apparatus of control and surveillance, which is infrastructural, and it's very violent, that has a very important role to play when we're talking about borders. Apart from the physicality of a non-existing line of division, there is also, you know, spaces and, and machines of control of that, which is sometimes are incomprehensible to us, right? And th the North Sea is full of data centers as well, <laughs> that in a way play a fundamental mm -hmm. role in these classifications, in storing these classifications, but also they have a very specific spatiality, right? And architecture, I would say. I mean, uh, one thing I wanted to add to that was actually um, a word that all of you brought up in, in your presentations in some form, which was this idea of smoothness. And you'd think in a conversation where we would prob problematize the border, smoothness would be the ideal outcome. But I thought what was really great was that all of you kind of critiqued or questioned the concept of smoothness. I think Platon talking about how the smoothness within Europe is um, as a result of kind of great acts of violence everywhere else. I think, Michelle, when you talked about the smoothness between city centers across, Euro across Europe and connecting them and also connecting maybe peripheries to other countries, but not necessarily connecting the city with its periphery. And then I think, Michael, with your presentation, the idea of smoothness as an aesthetic, like that as something smooth to hide, cover up, or as a mask to hide away, it was really fascinating. And I think to return to your question about the, the role of the architect potentially in creating these new tools, like to negotiate smoothness or to to critique smoothness and to maybe create more how through the kind of friction and conflict we can actually find ways forward to actually confront the other on the other side of the wall or um, 
actually, I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to what you each think are, are some of the tools we can use to, I guess, uh, I guess disrupt smoothness. Yeah, I think the, the smoothness is an interesting uh, aspect because I, I think that one way to initially think about it and talk about it is if there's no borders, then there's, there's smooth exchange between it. But actually, at the same time, when you think about uh, one of the reasons why certain factors within the United States want that border or, or certain factors in other places want that border is for us uh, to create a smoothness, not of, of movement through a border, but of along a border. Because it, it gives all of a sudden, a, and I use the word fiction because it is a total fiction, borders are always conflict sites. Uh, but it presents the idea of now we can be us and they can be them and smoothly we'll just slide past each other and this border will, will literalize, literalize that and just allow us to be us and them to be them and that's great. But that's such, such a problematic uh, thought and there's no way to remove the, the interconnectivity in which we're all existing in. And, and so it, it's only increasing problems when that kind of desire for, for smoothness of adjacency is proposed. I don't want to put it on the table. Well, I would say that uh, this could also be on the agenda um, for architects, not necessarily to look for a solution, but to make visible. So the smoothness consists to a large degree of uh, making things invisible. So there's all these uh, high levels of uh, control that are way higher, of course, than uh, decades ago, but we don't see them because they're hidden both in the aesthetics of uh, the infrastructure that you mentioned, of uh, airports, and they are welcoming lounge-like uh, spaces. But in fact, of course, they are also spaces of control and all these classifications that exist within that. And um, to uh, make that uh, visible in all its degrees, uh, I think that would uh, paint a very different picture of, uh, of our cities. Yeah, um, yeah the, the making, the making visible is an, is an important aspect. Uh, and, and one thing I wanted to maybe bring up with you and maybe talk about as well in, in the North Sea and in the Arctic, uh, the appearance of the borderless because of the real struggle being actually the oil that's underneath the ice and underneath the sea. Uh, so that there's a, there's a huge conflict going on over what doesn't look like a border but actually is a border. And, and I don't know, maybe in your research you, you've come across different ways this, this happens, or...? Absolutely. I mean, it's, that's a very important point. And the North Sea is actually a laboratory of all these new definitions or definitions of borders and spaces of control that are defined not in the traditional sense. I mean, as you were saying, in, when we were talking about borders in, in land, we have, we, have something very, we have a very specific spatiality in mind, right? Either a physical separation between A and B, or all the spaces that we experience every day, terminals, <laughs> airports. So we, in a way, we know what it means for subjects to go through these physical spaces. When we're talking about um, borders and areas of, of uh, resource extraction in uh, under sea or under the water, right? It's a completely different spatiality, which has its own representations, maps, um, algorithmic calculations, uh, risk management and assessment, so it's a very, uh, to us, it's a very interesting thing to investigate as, as, as architects as well. Um, and this is not just, I mean, risk for us, even fishing is a form of uh, intense resource extraction, because, you know, fish doesn't know borders. Yeah. I mean, but of course, with climate change, and which is anthropogenic, of course, this, even the, you know, the, the flow of the population of fish and how these territories change is something that, you know, communities, uh, all over the world have experience and changes their everyday lives, their habits, their, their mode of living, which I think it's something that we should never somehow, I mean, it's, a, it's something that we should investigate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an infrastructural space in that way as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the, I think the other thing that that implies too is that the borders that we're confronting are not just borders um, for people and populations, but for, for huge variety of non-human entities, borders for the flow of petroleum, borders for the flow of economies, borders for the flow of information, borders like, there's, there's a whole nother level in which this conversation becomes uh, really strange, really quickly. And what, what's going on with the, the border for the Boers between Denmark and Germany? 
They're, yeah. gonna, they're gonna make a bore wall? There is a bore wall uh, coming up now between uh, Northern Germany and um, uh, Denmark. I don't know if people, you know about it or not. Yeah. Um, because there's a certain disease uh, with, with mm -hmm. boars in Northern Germany and there's a very big pig industry in, um, in Denmark. So they're now uh, designing, a, I think, a two feet high um, bore their wall between um, the two. But, but it describes sort of the specificity you know, of, of lines that we're trying to draw and that it's almost that everybody, it's clear that there are so many different types of borders and everybody needs their own border, but I'm still wondering if we could, so I appreciate the idea of, uh, of making it visible and, and the, so the, either through aesthetics or just drawing it the way uh, Michelle is describing it. Um, I'm wondering, I, I don't think anybody here, like I'm, I'm still wondering how we could draw better lines basically, right? Because it seems like we are all um, observing the, 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 mul the multitude of lines that are being drawn and we're, we're, we're putting them into question. And even after we make them visible, can we actually draw, you know, better borders? Which is a very, <laughs> this is. <laughs> the, I, I have something that's gonna, it's gonna sound uh, first from left field, but then I think it, it'll okay. be able to be brought back in. And by the way, did you think that the bore wall is also gonna keep out toddlers? Exactly. So now, now the yeah. toddlers aren't gonna be able to move between uh, <laughs> Denmark yes. and Germany? And yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. any way that, you know, yeah. like very small, very small creatures. Yeah. Uh, uh, but here, here, here's what I was going to say. Uh, a little bit like when you, you, you come very directly to a parking spot and you spin out and slide into it, hopefully. Uh, lines on grounds versus marks in matrices. This is an aesthetic debate between drawing and painting. Um, but what it also is, is uh, every time you draw a line on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. it immediately creates an inside-outside, a bounding contour figure ground. Every line creates a ground. And that that's, is, an, is an aesthetic aspect of drawing. Marks and matrices, there, in painting there's no line. Painting is just building up colored marks and if those differences begin to become sharp enough, we, we say that's a figure. And then we say, okay, then that must be a ground that it's on. But it actually painting doesn't work through lines on uh, paper, it works through marks and matrices. All of our computational space works through marks and matrices, meaning that anything we, we see as a division is actually just a gradation of, of hues and saturations and brightnesses. And then why this kind of brings it up uh, in an interesting manner is all the data collection is essentially creating borders through those kind of subtle hues of variation of intensity of information. Uh, Michelle, one of, the, one of the most important things I think you brought up is the idea of temporality, mm -hmm. uh, in that we tend to think as borders, or we can think problematically about borders as lines on grounds, as if this is demarcating something with finality. But every mark in a matrix is creating difference that's variable through perception, how long you look at it, when you look at it, how fuzzy it gets, how fine it gets. And one of the most important questions and problems facing this debate today is the idea that there is not a uh, magic bullet solution to this. And the problem is temporality. Things that happen over long periods of time, uh, continual flows of migration, what happens when migrants come and then become part of that society and how and in which ways those things happen, and the, the eternal desire to continually try to solve it through a one-time immediate solution either in policy or in architecture is a little bit like thinking we can do it by drawing a line in the ground or a line in the sand. And actually we need to think uh, more broadly about the variations of, of uh, transformations of hue and intensity and, and how that changes over time. So we should paint our lines. We should. As architects. Yeah, architects uh, typically don't think that they're painters, but the fact that we use these things means we are. There, you know there's no lines in here, just right marks and matrices. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's um, temporality, temporality also has a uh, lot to do with um, the political systems mm -hmm. that um, 
the, the management and the, the, the policies for our cities derive from, especially in Western Europe, you see that the, the whole idea of a stable society that has been built over the, over the last 50, 60 years reflects in the regulations that we have for, for housing, for city building, uh, etc. And so it's not, of course, we, um, we should ask the question like, what can architects, planners, historians, uh, uh, bring to this question, but it's it's so much uh, the, the 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 question is so much broader and so complex that we um, uh, need to be aware of that. And um, I think also um, pick our battles wisely. So uh, this this topic of borders is indeed like a very broad uh, discussion. So what is it actually that you can tweak and so that we can you know mean something? Um, we, at this point, it would be great to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you this microphone. Hi. Hi, Michael. I really like everything you said. It's, I mean, I only understand like 50% of it, but I found it's really fascinating. The language you used to put like boundary, border, aesthetics, and aesthetics, put a lot of contrasting words all together. I just want to like go back, going back to the fundament theories. How would you define space, and how would you define aesthetics? And if you have to make a synthesis between space and aesthetics, what will be your response on that? And by the way, it's a really nice presentation for all of you guys. I think it's really inspiring. Thanks, a Microsoft Word. Yeah. <laughs> aesthetics. Thank you. Uh, I, I define aesthetics as. Um, every manner in which the world becomes sensible, and that it's, it's an initial relationship, that, that our initial relationship with everything is primarily starts with an aesthetic relation, uh, and then those aesthetics can lead to the desire for knowledge, the desire to behave differently, and then that re-transforms the ways in which we position, argue, and, and, and establish aesthetic relationships in the world. Um, and this can happen between humans in the world and also between many different things. So it's a relational question, and once there's a relational question, then there's a question about space. Uh, so I wouldn't, I can't put space in a different category than aesthetics. I think space is a, is a term that we've developed to, to speak about a certain kind of aesthetic relationship. And it also, uh, f from that then, I mean, I don't know if you've all, you're, we're all architects here, so at some moment we had this, this conversation very early in our, in our architectural career, which is a uh, professor comes over and says, I don't see the space. You've had that conversation, right? I remember the first one, I thought, oh my, what's, what's he talking about? Like air? What, you can't see the air? You can't see the volume? But then no, you realize, by being disciplined into the discipline through representation that you can articulate relationships between things and those then allow space to become visible in, in the, the process of making that which is invisible visible. And so that may initially be an aesthetic relationship, but then uh, very rapidly and very quickly once we have uh, spaces of aesthetics that allow people to identify relationships amongst them, each other, we have a political uh, relationship. We have a space of politics where groups are forming and formed identities that give them a potential voice. This is a, an idea that comes, for, to me at least, from uh, Jacques Rancière, uh, the, the redistribution of the sensible. Um, Michelle and Patton, do you have anything to add about the relationship between space? No, I would like to ask uh, you something. Like, <laughs> if you uh, would be um, called and uh, someone asked you, like, um, would you like to get a big design assignment, design the, the wall mm -hmm. between U.S. and Mexico? What would you say? Maybe this is where I would agree with, with Florian. Maybe I would walk away. <laughs> and, and that does sound like a, a, a cop-out, and, 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 but uh, at least in the way in which it is argued via the, 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 this, this, this guy who's the president of my country, um, uh, I wouldn't engage that. I would have to resist it. Now, if it was put on the table that there would be another way, another way in which to attempt to architecturally articulate the problems of borders, uh, 
That I'd be very interested in. But to design a wall, I, I would refuse. Not even the most beautiful, aesthetically pleasing <coughs> wall. Yeah. Because those aesthetics are problematic, uh, fundamentally. Yeah, just to get that clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm, please. I'm not talking about like designing a pretty wall. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you for that. Any other questions or people would like to contribute? Yes. I was just wondering. Sorry, can you make the mic? Thank you very much for a lovely uh, discussion. Um, I was wondering um, if you guys, I probably know some of the answers, but if you guys think that we need boundaries in order to define ourselves, so beyond recognizing the differences between ourselves and other people, and having the boundary, which is your skin and your body, um, and the way that you define yourself as different to someone else, or obviously celebrating your culture as being something that's different to someone else, and celebrating different cultures and those kind of things, do we need boundaries um, between us? Do we need the borders between the countries and stuff? And then I also had a second question, which was um, to do with boundaries in the city and borders in the city. And if you feel that there's any architecture, apart from a wall or apart from a fence or a river or whatever, if there's any architecture that exemplifies the idea of a boundary or borders, and if there's anywhere which is completely free of borders and boundaries. Um, well, just to, these questions are so big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? Mm. Um, I would say that um, um, even, well, that's maybe past your question if, they're, if they need to be there, but they exist. And that there is something interesting that we haven't um, dealt with as, uh, as architects and, and designers, which is the, the boundaries between the nation states of Western Europe, for instance, they have become increasingly important uh, as a de definer of identities, of national identities. And they have sort of been, this discussion has been hijacked by uh, right wing, mostly, uh, who have a way of um, sort of um, taking this identity discussion and making it in, into a political uh, one. This also connects to Brexit, of course, but we see it in every country in Western Europe. Um, and one thing that, uh, so now we're talking about designing the narrative. So this narrative that is opposite to this sort of uh, nostalgic um, idealizing the, the history of, uh, of a nation state, that, that narrative, that hasn't been uh, looked into, hasn't been designed, uh, and we're all, we speaking as the architects uh, professionals, are kind of wary of this discussion. It's a di and it's a dangerous discussion and we, are, we all know why. But I think this uh, narrative is something that uh, we cannot uh, leave to the other side, as it were. Mm. And, and, and not to, to go back to infrastructure, but uh, I, I've been in New York for almost two decades, but originally I'm on Los Angelino. And Los Angeles, uh, which a lot of people would describe as this kind of homogenous, just drift of zone of, of cultures and people and everything else, its freeway system, its infrastructure of highways produce uh, in the, produce divisions, and there's tent cities all over Los Angeles in, in, in an ever-increasing, intense manner. And um, so those, those freeways, those highways, will uh, create divisions. F for instance, here's, here's an example. Uh, I'm not going to get too specific. I don't know how many of you guys know, know Los Angeles, but uh, uh, I was born in one neighborhood, moved to another one, in between was it was it was a third neighborhood which i never experienced until i was uh, 18. but it's five minutes away from either side because we bypassed it through a freeway a highway and and so those things the infrastructures of cities are very strange very important and very real and that's a border that was created by ostensibly making a more quick uh, a quicker uh, connection. Uh, connection yeah Do we need borders is the, the other part of that question. Um, Florian? Well, I had a feeling that, as we all um, um, 
have pointed out, these borders are inevitable, right? Or there are borders everywhere. Indeed, you described even the, 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 the border of your own body. Um, and so it seems that we, um, um, and what I like what you were saying is about a certain sensibility about this um, edge. So actually, maybe the, that the border becomes more sensible to a certain extent. And we're all speaking about a certain awareness of these borders and being able to highlight these borders, being able to make these borders or developing a sensitivity about these borders. I think that's something that maybe comes out of this conversation. Um, but then I was thinking, can you make like a smart border? And immediately it becomes very scary, right? At the moment that we start designing sort of what the sensibility of that border would be, um, well, immediately the, um, the ethics come into play. And so I'm wondering, indeed, I think the, 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 the one great provocation is indeed, is can, you, can, can we design a non ethical border, which doesn't become a discussion about is it a beautiful fence or not, mm -hmm. right? Which basically is, can we imagine a non-judgmental border maybe? And I think that's, I, I think if we could train our architects to develop an awareness, so to say, of indeed the, or yeah, it's, it's like a deep investigation, no, into the, instead of the character of these borders, but still I think it's almost impossible to not enter into the discussion of, 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 ethic, of ethics, yeah. It's but maybe also to add to that, just because you brought up this idea of how skin is a border. Um, I teach a unit here as well, and like one of my students somewhere in this building is investigating um, borders at the micro scale, mm -hmm. because actually our skin isn't this rigid line between us and everything else. There's all sorts of bacteria and microbes and other things that we share with other people and we have a kind of a collective understanding of that and she's using that as a way to kind of develop a new role for the architect in, in redrawing lines yeah. that are fuzzier and are more blurred and, um, and that rethink kind of where does this building end and everything else begin. So borders exist but they can be rethought to be uh, a very different entity and a much more spatial entity than the kind of singular line that they're often drawn as. And I think that's a lot of what everyone yeah. here tonight has been talking about. Two, yeah, two, two things that, that pop up into my mind, especially since, since we're on this question about bodies. Uh, I was having this conversation last week in Germany with an artist named uh, Michael Boucher. And he did a sculpture, and he's not the only one to work with this, uh, working with scents and perfumes, and then, and then tying them into the HVAC system of uh, the building to, to create this different kind of landscape of, of uh, scent. But the way he's, ex he explained it to me was, was what kind of struck me. Uh, so, and, and he said, this is the biggest sculpture that building can ever have because it fills everything, including you. <laughs> it, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, that's a pretty interesting and strange way to, to say it. And it's in entirely non-visible, but uh, interpenetrating and coexisting with uh, what we call the insides of ourselves. The other thing, and this is, this is even stranger to me, but um, vision, we're talking about aesthetics, we always, we always view our, our, you know, our eyeballs as inside us, as if what starts, starts there. But everybody's done this, I know, because I was talking about this with my kids. You can feel the back of your eyeball. If you, if you just do that, you can actually feel the back of your eyeball, which means that these things are actually kind of halfway in and halfway outside of our bodies. And, and so maybe another way, and I know that's super weird and gross and, and, <laughs> and, and, and kind of freaky, but maybe the other thing about the borders, which we do need in, 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 in many ways, but when is, when is it hard, when is it soft, and when is it actually flip back and forth and allow uh, spaces of transgression or maybe even encourage spaces of transgression? That, to me, is an interesting question. So can we have a world without uh, difference? No. Uh, we can't just all homogeneously flow in and out of each other. Uh, do we want to all claim our own island, even though some people may say we're all alone together in our, in our little bubbles? That's, that's uh, depressing to me. Um, but can we establish potentially relationships where transgression, and this is where ethics becomes interesting because we cannot predetermine what will happen in, in the spaces of transgression, but it's actually important that they exist. What happens in the shadow of the data surveillance? Yeah? Sorry. Other questions? 
Um, I was hoping we could get a little bit deeper into um, the borders of economics and of ownership. Um, I think, Michelle, what you were talking about of the of uh, Milton Keynes being a form of borders that is actually very porous, um, that that our infrastructure allows our, our border to actually be airports or um, rather than the sort of the channel. Um, but equally, um, the the sort of uh, public-private park uh, that is developing much more frequently, Zuccotti Park, that kind of um, very, uh, very fluid and very non-visible kind of border that is increasingly uh, sort of forming how we interact with the city. And equally in terms of uh, the, the sort of the wealthy migrant versus the, the unwelcome migrant. Um, that, that sort of realm of ownership. And, and I think that within a city um, becomes a very strong border that often we pass through many times during a day. And the question yeah, is... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I wanted to... to Let's see them. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, maybe it's not a very well-defined question because it is such a, an ill-defined border, but I, it's, it's um, how, how these spaces manifest themselves. I mean, maybe this is obvious in some ways, um, just in, in, in ownership, but that um, often um, it's much more about narrative and identity and, and um, about these stories that we've told each other about who owns what that yeah. Uh, becomes, becomes more. Yeah, I think this is about visibility again. So about making visible these uh, invisible borders that exist in numerous places, like you were talking about the, the, the bottom of the, of the North Sea and the, the lines of, uh, of, the, of the fishery mm -hmm. that become so important, but also uh, a reinterpretation like Milton Keynes you would consider to be uh, in between London and Birmingham, maybe. But now, if you look at it in a different way, and uh, in real estate way, you would say it's in the, it's on the border, on the edge of London. So uh, this is also uh, changing over time, of course. What is in the border? What is within? What is without? And uh, to make this visible, I think, is the very first thing. Because some borders, why we're talking about it, is because borders are everywhere. Some are positive. We don't talk about them. Uh, but the negative ones, we want to get rid of them because they, uh, like the, um, the freeways in Los Angeles, they, they rob certain uh, places of possibilities or they make uh, certain parts of the city into an island or um, whatever, you know, that kind of borders is something that um, needs to be on the agenda. Yeah, and go. No, I think... Um, there is a, some has to do with uh, real estate and housing crisis in London and elsewhere that has a lot to do with uh, forms of investment and, and things that are allowed to happen and, you know, conditions where borders are porous and quite flexible. So, for example, you know, the golden visa uh, uh, thing that we have here but also elsewhere where you can invest an X amount of money to property, you immediately uh, get a passport. Um, or, you know, the way uh, displacement and dispossession happens in cities and how inequality is related to a series of, you know, investments and placement of investment in real estate and how this affects vulnerable individuals or migrants and refugees and how these classifications affect the organization of cities and infrastructure and access. All these are very important. I think, you know, if we want to relate, you know, let's say more physical, architectural, uh, borders and boundaries um, and things that we do in our discipline with a much broader conversation about national and international borders, I think issues like you know access to housing and how this is manifested in, in cities like London is something that we can start uh, uh, doing in a way. Huh? I was thinking of erasure, so rather than painting uh, borders, maybe we should, um, because it seems we haven't been able to define yet what is the best way to draw a line, right? Um, so then I'm wondering, and I was thinking of the, I, I don't know if people know the er Erased uh, the Koning, the work by uh, Robert Rauschenberg, where you still see the traces of um, um, the Koning's um, of drawing. And I was thinking maybe we should draw and erase and draw and erase and draw and erase over and over that you make really fuzzy sort of bad lines, but that maybe um, we should teach better how to erase rather than how to draw fuzzy, I'm, I, I don't know, as a, as a provocation. Yeah. 
So would it be the same as connect, erase? Not necessarily, because I think connect is, a, it, like, if you erase, you don't necessarily predict what will happen, right? Where as, as soon as you connect, you already have an intention. So I think that actually the removal and not being sure how things will play out um, and taking a step back and trying to control, um, I think could be maybe a, a very interesting task in, a, in, in say, a field <laughs> in which we know, we learn how to draw lines, right? I think it's very noble in this uh, era, which is uh, in the... I don't think the Brexit is about erasing borders. No. So that's uh, ideologically very a good uh, goal. Yeah, I, 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 I like it too, quite a bit, as an analogical way of thinking through it in representation. But then the next question is, all right, so what does that, what does that actually mean architecturally? What, what is the equivalent of erasure? Uh, uh, the scumbling, the leftover, because erasure implies there's something left over. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So not, not total erasure, partial erasure. And what, what would be an architectural partial erasure? I'm, I'm, the conversation was brought up of, what is called in New York and maybe here in London too, the, the POPs, the privately owned public spaces. And, and there, you don't see the division of economy, which is actually creating a, a border based on property ownership uh, and control and surveillance, yet visibly it looks like that's public space that I can go to and I can have my sandwich and, and we can be in the city. So is that is that a, how would you erase that? Or what would be the architectural way? Yeah. Because if you literalize it, like if you literally make that, that border of private property ownership visible, like by building a fence or a wall or something, you actually kill a certain thing that, that's working within the city positively, even though you are also then literally making a certain thing that operates in the city negatively, available for people to understand. Do, do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like both, it's, there's an ambiguity there. We should know that we're being watched, even though we all know we're being watched. I mean, think about these things we carry around in our, in our pockets. Uh, we all know we're being watched, but we all act as if we're not being watched. It's like the inverted panopticon. Uh, it's, it's uh, in the, so these pu privately owned public spaces, if we literalize them and sealed them off, immediately our city looks like it has much less public space. But we will then also gain the knowledge of how much we are controlled. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to seal them off. You could also dress like and behave like a, a hobo and uh, try to uh, sit down in one of these places. And then you will also find that these are not real public spaces. So there's numerous ways that you can make that visible. I think that's a great example, and I think it goes back to that point made earlier about how do we disrupt smoothness. And um, I was doing some research into privatized public spaces recently, and um, I think the Occupy movement in 2011, when they were occupying Paternoster Square in London, the only way they found out that it was privately owned was when they tried to occupy it, and then they were removed by court order because it was owned by the Mitsubishi estate State. company. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Sometimes the best way to maybe, maybe the first stage in erasure is actually revealing who owns what, and that is through a kind of disruptive act. Um, I'm, anyway, on that note, I'm sure we could continue this conversation for <coughs> like the whole night if necessary, but um, I think it's a, a nice point to kind of end on, on kind of questioning what are these ways of erasure. Um, and I wanted to take this uh, moment to thank everyone for coming, to thank our panelists, but also to remind you to come to the third lecture in the series on the 4th of March on the topic of Exodus, which picks up on a lot of these themes of, of um, moving people between spaces and, and what happens to the space left behind once the kind of mass migration has happened. Um, and to continue the conversation, please join us upstairs for some drinks um, where you can chat more to our speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you.